Good evening, everyone, and welcome to York's Observatory Teletube, the online astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. We're broadcasting live from the Allen Line Carswell Observatory located at York University in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Uh, Teletube broadcast every Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. local Toronto time. And for any questions or comments you may have about our past shows, or if you have any suggestions for future topics, please send us an email at observe at yorku.ca. You can also connect with us on Twitter or Instagram with the handle at York Observatory and Facebook at Alan I. Carswell Ops. I am Matt, and I'll be one of your hosts this evening, along with Arfa, Kat, Mahin, Sergey, and Tina. Tonight, we, ha we have an awesome presentation about the Juno mission. But before we get started uh, with our main show, we want to give you a little update on what you can see this coming week. So this week, we have the planet Mars, we have Arcturus, we have Procyon, we have Vega, and Capella visible in the night sky. Uh, Capella is actually known as the goat star because of the meaning of its name in Latin, which is nanny goat. Uh, it is also the brightest star in the Auriga Charatir constellation and part of the asterism or a stellar shape composed of six stars called the winter hexagon. As for Procyon, it is the eighth bright, uh, brightest star in the night sky and part of the constellation of Canis Minor. This star is also known as an animal, not as a goat, but as a dog. In this case, being part of the Canis Minor uh, constellation, it is known as the Little Dog Star. Uh, as for another important star in tonight's sky, we have Vega, which is actually the fifth brightest star, and it's part of the constellation of Lyra. And it is important because it is used as a reference star for the brightness comparison by amateur astronomers around the world. Here is an interesting fact about Vega that you may not know. You see, uh, because the Earth at Earth's axis wobbles, our perception of the North uh, gradually shifts to different stars over a 26,000 year cycle. Vega was the North Star several thousand of self years ago, and it will regain that status in about 12,000 years. We know that currently it is the star Polaris who holds the title of the North Star. But well, now you know that it won't stay like that forever. Um, well, now we have a wonderful presentation about a mission that had one of the most beautiful and amazing planets of the solar system as its main goal to study, uh, Jupiter. Jupiter is my favorite planet, as a matter of fact, for a bunch of reasons, especially because of its magnificent Van Gogh style atmosphere, and that with the help of the Juno mission, we have accomplished to study and visualize it like never before. But how did we do it? What did it discover? And all that uh, and more will be presented tonight, starting from the beginning. Go ahead, Mahin. Thank you, Matt. The Juno mission to Jupiter was launched on August 5, 2011, and was a necessary step towards understanding the formation of the solar system. Since Jupiter is the most massive planet of the solar system, it is thought to have an influence on its formation. Therefore, it was considered necessary to understand the origin and evolution of this planet. Questions like, what is Jupiter made up of? What drives its magnetic field? How early was it born, etc. are needed to be answered in order to reach the secrets of the solar system formation. Big planets like Jupiter are considered as the cornerstone of planet formation due to their early assemblage and capabilities to influence the orbits of other objects such as other planets, comets, and asteroids in their vicinity, which answers why Juno mission to Jupiter was so important. Although the basics of the origin of the planet were known, there was a lot more still to discover. The competing solar system formation theory suggested different content and mass of Jupiter's core. Therefore, core measurements could help find the more consistent theories by the process of elimination and help reach the ultimate goal of unwinding the secrets of how it all came into existence. After the acceptance of Juno mission proposed by JPL Jet Lab Propulsion Laboratory in 2005, the design and development of the spacecraft began. It was built by Lockheed Martin Corporation with project management by JPL and provision of instruments by many Italian and U.S. institutes. 
Initial planning involves the spacecraft and its trajectory along with some other major aspects. The spacecraft was to use a Delta V EGA trajectory, where EGA stands for Earth Gravity Assist, and Delta V indicates the utilization of hyperbolic excess velocity leveraging trajectory. It was placed in a heliocentric orbit, taking it beyond Mars, leading to two deep space maneuvers on 30th August and 14th September, respectively, in the year 2012, 30 months after launch which was followed by a gravity assist flyby of Earth at an altitude of 559 km on 9th October 2013, after which came the phase of orbit insertion maneuver, which placed it in a 107-day capture orbit during which the period reduction maneuver was performed to reduce the science orbit to 14 days. It was to conduct a total of 33 science orbits before the end of the mission, it was launched from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, Florida. Juno's primary goal is to unveil Jupiter's formation and evolution story. It aims to learn more about the atmosphere of Jupiter beneath its clouds from finding out more about the temperature, composition, motion of clouds, and other properties of it. It will help in getting to know more about the quantity of water in the atmosphere, which would help in figuring out how the planet was formed, and also if it has any discovered, undiscovered moons. The mission aims to find out how the intense magnetic field of the planet is generated, and will help map out the planet's magnetic and gravitational fields to help reveal the planet's deep structure. Another objective of the mission is to explore and study the magnetosphere of the planets near its poles, especially the auroras, which are Jupiter's northern and southern lights, helping in discovering more about the effects of its enormous magnetic force fields, which consist of trapped, electrically charged particles in its atmosphere. Ultimately, understanding Jupiter will help understand planetary systems, which are being discovered around other stars. The Juno mission was an investment of $1.13 billion, which includes the development of spacecraft, scientific instruments, mission operations, data processing, and relay support. There were some problems that were encountered by the mission. Although the spacecraft was designed to have a 14-day orbit, it ended up having a 53-day orbit due to the valves of its engines which were acting up. Because of this, the plans had to be altered a little and the mission has been extended until 2022. This does not affect any of the scientific results, rather it just elongates the time it takes to discover them. I will now hand it over to Kat to tell you more about the design of spacecraft. Thank you so much, Mahin. I will now consider the instruments that were specified for use on the Juno mission, as well as their functionalities. Juno was designed to withstand great amounts of radiation, sunlight, and extreme temperatures whilst functioning at high capacity. Upon launch from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station on August 5th, 2011, Juno was sent with several mechanisms to perform experiments to make the most of its voyage to Jupiter. On board the Juno mission are several items that make up the scientific payload, specifically the gravity science and magnetometers, microwave radiometer, alternatively MWR, the Juno cam, UVS and gyram, JEDI, yes, JEDI, Jade, waves experiment, the rotating spacecraft itself, electronics vault where the electronics are kept, and the solar cell design. I will expound on the specifics of these mechanisms and their importance to the mission. To begin, NASA included modes of calculating the distribution of mass within Jupiter, which were to measure gravity by radio waves established by the gravity science experiment. The uneven distributions of Jupiter's mass induce variations in gravity along Juno's route. Gravity and radio science experiments detect the Doppler effect on radio broadcasts from Juno to Earth in different frequency ranges. Another experiment that NASA scientists wanted to expound on is the magnetic field and related components of Jupiter. Juno's goal in this area was to map out the magnetic field, give scientists some kind of idea of the dynamics of Jupiter's interior, as well as mapping out the structure of the polar magnetosphere. This experiment consisted of a flux gate magnetometer, also known as FGM, and the advanced stellar compass, condensed as ASC. 
The former measured the strength and the direction of the magnetic field, whilst the latter documents the orientation of the magnetometer sensors. A microwave radiometer, also known as MWR, is a multi-wavelength microwave radiometer for observing the deep atmosphere of Jupiter. It primarily focuses on observing the previously unseen atmospheric features and chemical abundances hundreds of kilometers into Jupiter's atmosphere. MWR was designed specifically to detect six different frequencies using separate antennas and achieved maximum penetration of 350 to 400 kilometers below the cloud tops. The goal of MWR was to determine the abundances of sulfur, oxygen, and nitrogen, which will, in turn, shed light on Jupiter's early life. By considering the lower layers of the planet, it also focused on its search for water, which could tell the onlooking scientists more about the solar system. Upon closer inspection, MWR detected major temperature changes in the storm of the Great Red Spot, as well as an identification of an ammonia-rich layer. As well, it detected hundreds of lightning discharges, mostly found in the polar regions. The JunoCam is the mechanism that is used to take colored pictures of Jupiter to be sent back to Earth. Alongside the professional images from JunoCam, amateur astronomers are welcome to participate in a virtual imaging team by taking pictures of Jupiter with their own telescopes. This creates a platform for people to discuss what exactly the JunoCam should try to image as it passes over the planet. Once Juno approaches Jupiter, these amateur astronomers will process the image to formulate colored images. In a summary, it gives the public an opportunity to contribute to Juno mission decision making and image analysis. The JunoCam itself has four types of filters, like most astrophotography equipment do, red, green, blue, and near-infrared. The red, green, and blue strips appear following one spacecraft rotation, whilst the near-infrared strips appear on the second rotation. The final image is produced by combining the strips with very accurate color and strip alignment. This visible light camera was designed to take very high-resolution photographs of Jupiter's poles and atmosphere whilst it was approaching Jupiter at closest approach, approximately 5,000 kilometers above the clouds. The hardware of JunoCam is based on the Mars Descent Imager that was also developed for use on the Curiosity Mars rover and similarities to that of the camera software for the Mars Odyssey and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecrafts. The next two major scientific payload aboard Juno is a UVS, ultraviolet imager and spectrometer, and a GYRAM, Jovian Infrared Auroral Mapper. The UVS is supposed to record the wavelength and precise positions of ultraviolet photons at intervals where Jupiter is in the view of the spectrograph slit with every turn of the craft. Through the use of a microchannel plate detector, UVS will formulate images of the UV auroral emissions as shown on the bottom left. GYRAM operates in the near-infrared and surveys the upper layers of Jupiter's atmosphere whilst also producing images of the aurora whose regions are hydronium dense. One of GYRAM's primary missions revolved around determining how water-rich clouds move and simultaneously calculating the abundance of methane, phosphine, and ammonia in the atmosphere. The next instrument in question is the Jovian Energetic Particle Detector Instrument, or JEDI, was implemented into the mission to measure and monitor the angular distribution and the speed of electrons and ions at high energy. These specified ions and electrons were in Jupiter's magnetosphere, working alongside the magnetometers to identify magnetic characteristics of Jupiter. The Jovian Auroral Distributions Experiment, also known as JADE, was added to the experiment list to calculate the angular distribution, energy, and speed of electrons and ions at low energy. This is in contrast to JEDI, which calculates at high energies. These specified ions and electrons were to be found in Jupiter's aurora. The next piece of equipment whose electronics are in the electronics vault is, it is the uh, radio and plasma wave sensor, whose experiments revolve around wave patterns. This particular experiment will determine which regions of the auroral currents help to define the radio emissions and the progression of auroral particles' route. This is possible via the uh, measurement of the radial and plasmal spectra-dense regions in Jupiter's aurora. Juno is best known for it being a rotating spacecraft. 
using pioneer methods of spinning to make the craft's pointing very stable and quite easy to control. Juno was spun up by a rocket motor on its second stage rocket booster at one rotation per minute for cruising, two rotations per minute for science operations, and five rotations per minute for engine maneuvers. Tina will be speaking more on the maneuvers in a little while. Whilst the craft was in Jupiter's orbit, it swept the fields of view of its instruments through space once for each rotation. Upon two rotations per minute, the instruments' field of view swept across Jupiter approximately 204 times in the span of two hours, which would normally take Juno to fly from one pole to the other. In order to protect all of the equipment aboard the craft, Juno carried the first radiation shielded electronics vault to protect them from the mass amounts of incoming radiation. Each of the titanium cubic components' has eight sides measure nine square feet in area, one centimeter thick, and weighing in at 18 kilos. This massive vault weighs a total 200 kilos and contains the command and data handling box, the power and data distribution units, and all the related electronic assemblies. This particular feature of the craft is relevant to one of the missions associated with Juno, NASA's Vision for Space Exploration, or VSE, addressing the vital requirement for protection against extreme radiation in environments beyond the safety of low Earth orbit. In all of NASA's history, the Juno mission was the first of its kind to operate at such a large distance from the sun, which required the installation of very, very large solar panels. To be precise, the orbit of Jupiter is five times further from the sun than the orbit of Earth's, implying that, the, that Jupiter receives 25 times less sunlight than Earth does. Three solar panels extend outwardly from the hexagonal body of Juno, putting the span of the spacecraft at a whopping 20 meters. Juno was sent out to receive a constant stream of sunlight from the moment of launch to the end of the mission, with the exception of a few minutes during the Earth flyby. Before the launch itself, the large solar panels must be folded at each of their four hinges so the spacecraft is able to fit in the launch vehicle and will be released shortly thereafter. Juno has a magnificently modern renovation to the solar cell design, including cells that are 50% more efficient and radiation tolerant than those that were used only a couple of decades ago. The power needs for the mission were quite low, averaging at about six hours of full power required for the instruments every 14 day orbit. This design minimizes the damaging radiation exposure, whereas all scientific measurements were done with solar panels facing the sun. To the left, you can note the engineers testing these massive panels, and to the right, note the length of the solar cell design relative to the public transportation bus. The final testing of the solar panels was a big deal, seeing as the next time the solar panels would uh, be extended at full length would be when Juno left Earth at 7 miles per second. All three of these panels at 2.7 meters wide and 8.9 meters long generated enough energy to power only five standard light bulbs at approximately 450 watts of electricity. Crazy. Now that we've covered the spacecraft design and some of the more fine functionality details, I'd like to swing things over to Tina to tell you more about the mission's launch and successes. Thank you, Kat. Now I'll discuss the maneuvers used to collect data. I will separate this into three distinct sections. First, the challenges that it had to overcome with mass. Second, the challenges it had to overcome with charged particles. And then I will cover how it overcame these challenges with its maneuvers. Jupiter is widely considered an exciting planet to study because of its amazing size. It is 300 and without being drawn in by its gravitational pull. So for Juno to do this required some groundbreaking creative feats of engineering. In July, 2016, Juno fired its British built engine for 122 seconds. Then it decelerated and then it entered Jupiter's orbit in its closest encounter ever. Indeed, Juno was going somewhere no spacecraft had been before just a few thousand kilometers above the clouds, and then it would come right back out. So there were many variables to consider when planning the flight path. The engine had to fire at just the right time and for just the right duration so that the burn path would lead precisely into orbit and out 
into a 1,000 day ellipse. Furthermore, Jupiter has a large magnetic field, which means that particles are constantly accelerated to large velocities during its insertion maneuver, which is very dangerous for electronics on man-made spacecraft. For example, the spacecraft could charge up past its capability, causing electrostatic discharges and creating magnetic fields. Of course, magnetic fields can damage sensitive equipment. We can witness the same phenomenon when we are going to MRI scans. The magnetic wave generated can damage pacemakers or defibrillators. So there are special warnings for those who wear these devices. Indeed, the Juno spacecraft was subjected to the same radiation as one million dental x-rays. Its shell, therefore, was specially designed to handle excess radiation. Here we can see a model of the trajectory from Earth to Jupiter in several orbital ellipses. You can see that it takes several ellipses to reach Jupiter rather than a straight one just from Earth to Jupiter. This is to use the gravity of several bodies to slingshot Juno into increasing orbit, which saves fuel, but also comes at the cost of time. The last fuel burn puts Juno right into Jupiter's orbit at the right time, and so it enters Jupiter's orbit at last. Luckily, the path it followed was the original plan set by NASA. And as Mahin also described in the early planning stages, it did not need to use any backup plans in the insertion maneuver to the excitement of many aerospace engineers. It proved that our technological advancements in this field worked and they worked well. As previously mentioned, the two largest challenges for Juno to overcome while visiting Jupiter were also the two factors it was sent to study, gravity and magnetic fields. It had specialized tools on board to measure these as it passed over several parts of Jupiter during the rendezvous. For more detailed observations, I will pass you along to Arfa. Thank you, Tina. Here are some of the fascinating secrets that are discovered about the gas giant by the Juno mission deep water abundance at Jupiter's equator. According to a new analysis of data collected by NASA's Juno spacecraft, water makes up about 0.25% of the molecule in Jupiter's atmospheric molecules at the gas giant's equator. That's almost three times that of the sun. What really surprised the scientists was that water and ammonia are not well mixed in Jupiter's deep atmosphere. Also, Global water abundance critically constrains Jupiter's formation and interior structure. However, the global water's abundance differs on different regions of the planet, and studies are still being made to assess the global water abundance on different latitudes of Jupiter. Jupiter's magnetic field affected by the atmospheric winds. Scientists predict that Jupiter's changing magnetic fields by time are majorly caused by atmospheric winds that extend over 3,000 kilometer deep. These winds are highly conductive in planet's interior and advect the field, sharing it apart and carrying it around the planet. Jupiter's atmospheric jet stream. Scientists were also surprised by discovery of the data collected on how deep Jupiter's atmospheric jet stream span. Due to Juno mission, they were able to collect evidence showing that Jupiter's zones and belts penetrate 3,000 kilometers down into planet, answering a fundamental question of whether Jupiter's powerful atmospheric jet streams are shallow or deep. All the research and data collected conclude that Jupiter's asymmetric nature may lie deep inside Jupiter. Io's effect on the Jupiter's aurora. By the help of Juno infrared observation, scientists were surprised by showing mysterious new details related to Jupiter's volcanic moon, Io. Particles from Io volcanoes become charged, creating a torus around Jupiter. Due to these particles traveling up to Jupiter's magnetic field and crashing into Jupiter's atmosphere, produce an auroral mission. Juno discovered that the torus splits into two streams and that the aurora shows mysterious re reflections behind Io's footprints. New radiation belt. Juno discovered a new radiation belt resting just above Jupiter's atmosphere. The new belt is created by energetic neutral atoms from afar. Ionized by 
impact with Jupiter's atmosphere, the new belt is comprised of high energy sulfur, oxygen, and hydrogen ions that are thought to be created by neutral atoms originating afar becoming ionized when they hit Jupiter's atmosphere. Radiation belts around strongly magnetized planets pose critical challenge to space missions. Scientists plan to discover more about the gas giant and its moon in near future. Sergey will tell us more about the future mission to Jupiter. Thank you, Arfa. There are several missions planned to explore Jupiter and its surroundings in the near future. Today, we'll discuss a few of them, namely the Jupiter Ice Sea Moon Explorer, the Europa Clipper, the Ju Jupiter Colossal Orbiter, the Jupiter System Observer, the Io Volcano Observer, and Lucy. The Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer, or JUICE, is scheduled to launch June 2022 by the European Space Agency. It will pass Ganymede, Callisto, Europa, and then go into orbit around Ganymede with the goal of studying Jupiter and its satellites, namely Ganymede. Ganymede will have its surface, its interior, and exterior studied. The Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer will study Ganymede's ocean layers and find subsurface water reservoirs, and it will study and map the physical features of its surface and icy crusts. It aims to understand Ganymede's internal mass distribution, its interior, interior geology, its exosphere and magnetic field. Europa, on the other hand, will be searched for organic molecules necessary for life and to understand more about its surface features and to find out what the non-water ice material is made up of. The Europa Clipper mission aims to orbit around Jupiter, where it can occasionally come close to Europa. Europa will have its ice shell and any subsurface water studied, including its oceans, to find out whether or not chemistry necessary for life can survive in it, and to understand its surface activity. The Europa Clipper mission is scheduled to launch sometime between 2023 and 2025. The Jupiter Callisto Orbiter, or GCO, will focus on Callisto, whereas the Jupiter System Observer, GCO, will focus on Io. The Jupiter Callisto Orbiter is planned to orbit around the northern and southern poles of Callisto with the possibility of also having a lander with it. The Jupiter System uh, Observer is there to understand how Jupiter's gravity causes volcanism on Io. After most of its work is done on Jupiter's satellites, the Jupiter System Observer is planned to orbit the, orbit the Sun-Jupiter Lagrange point, which is where the gravitational pull of the Sun is equal to that of the gravitational pull of Jupiter, leading to less movement. Both the Jupiter Callisto Orbiter and the uh, Jupiter System Observer are scheduled to launch in 2029 and arrive at their destination in 2035. The Io Volcano Observer will track Io's internal heat flow below its surface and record photos and videos of Io's extreme volcanism at least 10 times over four years when it gets close to Io. The Io Volcano Observer is scheduled to launch January 2029. Lucy, named after the Australopithecus skeleton that was vital for the understanding of human evolution, is scheduled to launch October 2021 with the goal of understanding the time capsules from the birth of our solar system, Trojan asteroids. They will have the same orbit as Jupiter, but are either ahead of or behind Jupiter in its orbit. Our understanding of Jupiter and its surroundings has a bright future ahead of it. Well, everyone, you have been listening to the Alan I. Carswell Observatory's weekly tell to broadcast, the Astronomy and Astrophysics program, written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. The hosts this evening have been Matt, Mahin, Kat, Tina, Arfa, and myself, Sergey. Make sure to leave any comments or questions in the comment section of the video and talk to us in the chat right now. We'll be around for the next 20 minutes to answer your questions. All of our programs are free, but if you would like to make a donation or buy one of our observatory calendars, see our website at observatory.info.yorku.ca. You can always contact with us on Twitter with the handle at York Observatory and check out our website for show notes, content, updates, and contact info at observatory.info.yourq.ca. Thanks for tuning in. Clear skies and have a good night.